Hi everyone! Our radio pharmacy snack of today is to look at quality control of radio pharmaceuticals in a very broad way. So it's snacks, very easy to digest hopefully. Where do you get your methods for radio pharmacy quality control? You can obtain it within the package inserts of already validated products in monographs if they have been published, which also shows you the radio pharmaceutical is already validated in the clinic, as well as guidelines from your nuclear authority, specifically with regards to the radionuclide itself. It is very important to remember that all of these methods still has to be validated in-house. What that means is that you have to show that if you follow the methods, you can get the same outcomes as what they prescribe in these guidelines. You should be able to show that what you do is exactly the same and therefore your results is trustworthy. The first quality control parameter that you most often look at is physical characteristics. And it's basically eyeballing the radio pharmaceutical and seeing if it changed color or if there's any particles floating around. This could be a little bit dangerous. <laughs> I'm not saying you should take it out, out from behind the lead sheet, shield, but you should make sure that there is enough light and visibility that you can see anything that's off. It's a very good um, thing actually. And in my life, it has made um, one or two products fail. So please do look at what you are injecting. The next one is pH. There is two reasons why we want to know what the pH is. And the first is if the product is unstable at certain pHs, you must make sure that it is at the correct pH to ensure stability and integrity. And then the other one is patient comfort. Probably not a big deal in radio pharmaceuticals because we inject very small volumes and the blood has quite a large buffer capacity. But for patient comfort, seven is always best. So I think what is most important is to actually have this um, written down in your, your batch in batch report. And also to note if it's um, if you validated the synthesis and you know what the normal pH is and then all of a sudden it's different. I think that's also a warning sign. Osmolarity, isotonicity and ionic strength is of relative importance in some instances, especially if you are going to do um, administration um, in the central nervous system through a lumbar puncture, as is the case with systemography, then it has to be tested. But normally, if you use the buffers that is prescribed in the clinic, like phosphate buffered saline, it takes care of this. It also is important to dilute your radio pharmaceutical as prescribed. Radionucleotic purity is of utmost importance because we want to know that we are injecting the right radionuclide. If you want an image of technetium, contamination by the parent isotope of molybdenum is not at all what you want. Um, you have to test and see if you have the right radionuclide species in your um, batch. So there is a few ways to test this. So one is half-life measurement because each radio pharmaceutical decays by its own half-life. So you measure at time point zero and in 10 minutes for gallium, for instance, and then you see if the uh, decay is as expected. Or you can do some other tests where you look at the um, emission characteristics of the radionuclide and see if that is the same. For generators, there's normally extra test. Um, for technetium eluates, there is the molybdenum breakthrough test. For gallium 68 elutions, there is the germanium breakthrough test. So there's all these ways where you can look at radionuclide purity and identify that you are injecting the right radionuclide into. The next test is radiochemical purity, where the percentage of total radioactivity present in the desired chemical form is tested. This is the form you want to inject into the patient that is your radio pharmaceutical that you are looking at. So you can get free radioactivity, you can get radioactivity linked to your 
vector that would um, cause your biodistribution and then you can also get um, little crystals or um, you know not nice um, things like colloids which will go to the liver because it's just big smudgy particles so we use chromatography where you would spot the mixture at the bottom which we call the origin then you will take this um, paper that is your stationary phase it has unique qualities and associate um, have a unique affinity for each part of your mixture and you will then um, incubate it with your uh, mobile phase which has different affinities to the mixture which make every type of chemical act differently so you spot it you incubate it and then you will see they will um, go through the solvent and move up the stationary phase at different paces and then when it's um, done incubating you can measure the areas and then you can create a graph which will tell you the percentage purity of your compound then you can also test chemical purity with um, other methods that I will not discuss now, we will go into them more depth in another video, but there is HPLC, also the same chromatography, testing for radio, radio chemical purity, but also in this case, it can test chemical purity, which is an additional benefit. You can do mass spectrometry to see the total mass of the chemical form. You can do some chemical purity test. This is not to see if there is other chemicals you don't want. Um, in this case, you have colorimetric tests to determine if there's any alumina in your um, eluate. And then you also can test for residual solvents on gas chromatography, which is also a chemical impurity. So that is chemicals that is not radioactive or that could contribute to problems for the patient. This is just a a uh, nice image drawn by Nastasha to show gas chromatography and I think it's quite informative. You can detect if there is nasty um, chemical solvents in your mixture like acetonitrile or anything that you definitely don't want in your patient. Sometimes your synthesis methods is complicated and it's needed that you have those solvents but they should be removed by some form or another and then you can test for their presence. You have to test for the microbial side of the product. So bacterial endotoxin test is a bit of a misnomer because it then says to you, you're testing for something from bacteria. And indeed, bacteria can make these endotoxins, but they can come from various um, places. So you test for any um, chemical byproduct that could lead to a uh, reaction in the patient which is normally um, fever and it is dangerous and very uncomfortable for the patient and you can only get um, a good quality product if you make sure that everything you've used during the synthesis doesn't have these endotoxins in, in and then you can test it with this um, automated bacterial endotoxin test that we like to use or in the past they used rabbits and all of those things. We will also go into that at another point. The membrane filter integrity test is to test if your um, filter that you used is still intact afterwards. The filter is used to um, final sterilization of your product. So you test if that filter is okay and then you release it. The problem with radio pharmaceuticals is the half-life is so short that you can't test for sterility and then give it to the patient. So this is a surrogate measurement to see if at least the filter you used was intact and then you can give it to the patient. Sterility testing for two weeks later comes later. So you take your cold radio pharmaceutical, send it off to the microbiology lab. They look for fungi and bacteria anaerobe and aerobe and then they give you the information after the fact. Now why would we do that? Just to give a track record and in, indeed let you know if there is a problem that you should start looking at your method. So that's more like a quality assurance thing where you can put that information back into the system but it won't influence that specific radio pharmaceutical that was made because you can't go back and uninject it two weeks later after you've given this is the end of this short introductory video in quality control of radio pharmaceuticals. 
I am a radio pharmacist, so I have knowledge about all the methods described. So please let me know down in the comments if you want some more in-depth information on any of the topics we covered today. Or you can let me know what else you want me to present to you. You can please subscribe, that would mean a lot. And then I also just want to say thank you to Byrender for giving my, uh, having this nice program that I can use to make all the figures that I've done in this presentation. Hope you guys have a lovely day.